Welcome to Medscape. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with a fellow epileptologist, Dr. Jacqueline French. Dr. French, welcome to Medscape. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. Well, I thought it would be important to talk today because uh, I heard you on another podcast of talking about your paper. So I went and read the paper and you are the lead author of a, uh, a short and concise but very important paper about the FDA's new warning on lamotrigine. So could you tell us, give me your background and tell us about that. So uh, it was interesting. Um, we first uh, got news that the FDA was concerned about this. Um, I think it was about uh, 2021. Um, or the end of 2020, uh, we, we woke up to a warning that basically uh, the FDA had put out saying that uh, physicians should avoid the use of lamotrigine in any patient who had a history of cardiac disease. Now, um, I will tell you that as an epileptologist, we actually think that lamotrigine, among many drugs that are available for treatment with epilepsy, uh, is actually an excellent choice, uh, particularly among elderly people, because it doesn't cause sleepiness, it doesn't cause uh, memory problems and confusion. Uh, it's pretty well tolerated overall. I know that there are issues because it has to be started slowly and there's an issue of rash, but nonetheless, you know, uh, epileptologists are actually um, quite enthusiastic about using lamotrigine and many of our patients do indeed have uh, some sort of cardiac history. Uh, the, the original warning said avoid use, and that is actually quite a strong warning. Um, and you know, usually it, it requires quite a bit of background uh, indicating that harm has occurred before such a warning would be issued. Uh, but in fact, this one was based, as we found out, on not uh, human data of people uh, having harm from this drug, but in vitro data, suggesting that there was the possibility of harm. In addition, um, this is probably, as we talked to our cardiologist colleagues, which is the first thing that we did, um, we found that, in fact, they believed very strongly that this would be a class effect, that it would not be something that would be exclusive to lamotrigine, but would likely be uh, true for, uh, you know, this, this finding um, would actually be true for all uh, uh, drugs that are sodium channel blockers, and there are quite a few in the field, including phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine, and other commonly used drugs. So um, there was a lot to, to sort of take in in the beginning. Um, when we talked to our cardiology colleagues, one thing that we did learn is that they did believe that this was a situation where we should be um, cautious about the use. It, you know, it doesn't mean that there isn't an effect. It means that we should think about the effect, we should be cautious. There are patients in whom probably an EKG is warranted, but that's probably true for, again, all the sodium channel blockers and not just lamotrigine. Um, but even in those patients, the drug can be safely used. And certainly nobody should consider withdrawing their patient off of lamotrigine who's doing well on it. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we actually had an interaction with the FDA. We discussed these matters and fortunately, uh, after several months, they made a change in the wording of what is now the, 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 um, the label of lamotrigine. And now it says appropriately that when you use this drug in certain populations, you should weigh the risks and the benefits. And you know that, that really fits much better with the way we feel about it. Well, this topic caught my attention because lamotrigine is widely used, as, as you say, it's a great drug, in the epilepsy po population. It's also approved for bipolar disorder, and it's widely used by psychiatrists, you know, for even in the broad mood disorder, and then Depakote used to be a very popular drug for young uh, adults, but because of the teratogenicity uh, data, now lamotrigine tends to be the go-to drug instead of Depakote. 
And when I looked this up, it said that lamotrigine was FDA approved in 1994. That was a long, long, long time ago, although we remember that time uh, we were working as epileptologists, but it still seems like kind of a long time ago. Why is this information suddenly coming to light now? Uh, it basically uh, related to a, um, an in vitro test that was done by GlaxoSmithKline, if you remember who they were, right? <laughs> um, they were the uh, they are the manufacturers of, of um, branded Lamotrigine, um, and they they had this uh, in vitro study, and I'm not sure why, and they felt obliged to report the results to the FDA, and the FDA then required them to do additional testing. Um, and that additional testing is the basis. And, you know, because this is actually proprietary data between um, the FDA and GlaxoSmithKline, interestingly enough, it is not in the public domain. So, um, or it wasn't at that time. So we really did not have uh, the ability to go and look at what that data was. We just know that there was in vitro data that was supporting this. But again, um, you know, we do believe that, you know, in people who have heart block, um, bundle branch block, and, and other cardiac issues, that there is a reason to, um, you know, to, to use caution when using lamotrigine, and that, you know, uh, clinicians should, in certain populations, so, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, women of childbearing age, you know, people under the age of 60, um, probably, you know, you don't need to do an EKG, you don't need to, um, you know, really do anything different. But, you know, in somebody who you don't have an EKG on that you're, you're thinking about starting Lamotrigine, uh, it's probably a good idea just to get an EKG or somebody who has a history of any cardiac issues um, to make sure that there's no bundle branch block or something else that would make you Brigada syndrome or something else that would make you concerned. And the good news is, you know, we used to think that the fact that we had to titrate Lamotrigine was a bad thing, but in this case, it's a good thing because at the low doses that you start with, there really is very little concern for harm. So you have, you, you have a little time to get that EKG just in case somebody doesn't have one on their chart um, and then, you know, act on it, refer them to a cardiologist or whatever if you find something unexpected. Um, and it doesn't interfere with your starting the drug when you want to start it. Oh, well, okay. Well, that's great. So from a practical point of view, if it's a young patient and they're healthy, less than 60, you don't have to do anything different. But Unless if it's they a have a cardiac history, which, you know, is different, then you want to look at that. So if, if they have a cardiac history, but if they're 60 or older, you should get an EKG and you can get that the same day that you write the script. Is that right? Yes. But, you know, interestingly enough, you know, we as a neurology community, you know, I've heard a lot of people uh, significantly push back on this because we're not accustomed to, you know, this sort of monitoring of getting an EKG. Interestingly enough, I talked to my husband, who's an infectious disease specialist. Um, it's, it's really in their day-to-day -day, um, activities that they often have to get an EKG before or as they're starting uh, different medications. So to him, it seemed like a nothing burger, as they say. But to a neurologist who's not accustomed to it, it sounds like it's an enormous burden. But, you know, I just want to reassure everybody, it really isn't. And, you know, in this day and age, quite frankly, you know, I would say 95% of our patients have an EKG on their chart from, you know, some visit or other uh, at the time we're seeing them. And, you know, Probably if they don't, it's not a bad idea for us to get an EKG um, uh, because there, you know, there, there is a, an interaction between the brain and the heart. All right. So, but let me go back to our experience with Lamotrigine. We've been using it for years and years, right? Decades. And how is it that this risk of arrhythmia and death that if it's real, nobody noticed? Well, you know, this is a very interesting thing. You know, it, first of all, um, there's a lot of data to support that there is no risk. So, you know, there have been papers that have written since this warning came out where people have done meta-analyses of many studies suggesting that there really isn't a smoking gun 
uh, that even the sodium channel blockers as a, as a group have a higher risk of cardiac death than other drugs that you might expect, you know, but you can, you have to think about a couple of things. First is, you know, that we unfortunately live in a world in the epilepsy world where sudden death is not uncommon. So there is a, something called sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, as you know, or SUDEP, which occurs, you know, sudden unexplained death, one out of a thousand people with epilepsy and, you know, higher risk in, um, in, you know, certain high risk groups. So if this, you know, risk was low, a lower incidence than that, or much lower incidence than that, it would get lost, you know, because we would presume any sudden death was a SUDEP. So it's a little difficult for us to get a signal and that's why people have gone and looked to see whether, again, SUDEP deaths or overall deaths are higher in this group than you would expect. And so far, it's been relatively reassuring. In addition, um, there have actually been studies done of lamotrigine versus other drugs in elderly people. Um, and there, again, you know, if this is occurring, which again, I don't think that there is a very high risk, but if it's occurring, it must be an extremely low risk because when you do studies of several hundred people, certainly you don't see it, even if you, you know, start with an elderly population. Um, and uh, any risk that's occurring there is being, you know, uh, hidden by the larger unfortunate group of people who have other reasons for sudden death and epilepsy. Okay, now in terms of the cardiac workup, uh, you mentioned EKG. Is there any reason to get a cardiology consult or an echo, or is a normal EKG uh, good enough? If you have a normal EKG, you don't have to worry. If you have an abnormal EKG, you know, there are, you know, and, and I'm happy to say the article that you mentioned, you know, we, we knew that and this was an article that was written by the International League Against Epilepsy and it was a collaboration of neurologists and cardiologists, very good cardiologists. Um, we knew that the community would need operational, you know, instructions of what to do. And that is exactly what is in that article. It's very clearly written out who needs an EKG, who doesn't need an EKG, uh, if the EKG is abnormal, these are the kind of abnormalities that would not bother you. These are the kind of abnormalities that you would need a cardiology consult after that. All right, so we'll put a, a link uh, to that article uh, in the show notes here uh, so that it's 2021. And it's, uh, as you say, it's a collaborative article between the International League Against Epilepsy and the American uh, Epilepsy uh, Society. So one last question, does the FDA work like in total isolation? You know, it would seem to me that if you're gonna come out with a warning about a epilepsy drug, that you would talk to the epilepsy people first. But I don't know, does that happen? Didn't, didn't look like it happened. What, how does this work? Um, they actually don't because they are concerned that, you know, we might be biased in favor of our drugs, which of course we probably are. Mm. Um, However, um, um, I actually run something through the Epilepsy Foundation where I'm Chief Medical Innovation Officer um, called the Research Roundtable for Epilepsy. And this occurs once a year. And uh, we actually sit down uh, with uh, the members of the FDA that are involved in epilepsy, you know, in, in um, approving epilepsy drugs exactly so that we can increase the lines of communication it's been working extremely well. There are issues where, you know, there may be differences of opinion and we actually get to sit down at the table and discuss them. Um, and it has led to um, real improvement in um, the communication. So there is, there is a, a lot that can be done. Um, our colleagues at the FDA, they're, they're doing their best and uh, you know, they're really smart people. So, you know, really it's a question of getting that information across both directions. Terrific. Well, Dr. French, is there anything you'd like to add before we close? 
I, I will just add what I added uh, when I gave a talk on this at the American Epilepsy Society meeting, which is don't panic. Continue to use lamotrigine because it's an excellent drug. Yes. And uh, I feel uh, reassured it well when I'm when I'm writing that script and explaining to the patient, uh, I'll just keep that over 60, less than 60 heart disease, no heart disease uh, in mind. That's great. Well, this has been a great discussion. Thank you for sharing your insights on this important topic with Medscape.